Today we will explore 10 CLI tools without which my life would be meaningless. Well, maybe not meaningless, but certainly much less productive and harder. So without further ado, those are 10 CLIs I use on a daily basis and you should use them as well. The first tool is EZA, which is effectively a replacement for the LS baked in all shells. With LS, we can list files and directories in the current directory or anywhere else. Now, here is the output of EZA. Now, that by itself might not be that impressive since the only notable difference is that EZA output is color. You know, pretty colors, a lot of them. Actually, scratch that. Colors alone make it much easier to distinguish between different types of files and directories. Nevertheless, there is much, much more that EZA offers. We can, for example, display extended file metadata as a table and ensure that all files, including hidden ones, are listed. That's still very similar to what we would get if we would execute ls-la, but nicely colored. So let's spice it up a bit more by executing EZA, just as we did before, but by hiding permissions, file sizes, user and time, and adding information from Git. Now we have a clean colored output with the files and directories and also git statuses of each of them. We can easily see that the devbox json and devbox lock are modified. EZA has a massive number of parameters we can use to customize the output. Now I will not go through all of them, that would be silly. That's something you can explore on your own. The only thing that I will add is that my brain is wired to type ls instead of EZA. And if your C is as well, you might want to create an alias in zshrc or bashrc or whatever shell, whichever shell, not whatever, whichever shell you're using. As a result, every time you execute ls as you would normally do, you will get a nicer and more useful default output. From there on, we can add additional arguments depending on what we're trying to do, like for example, show all files and directories in a tree-like structure. Now, that was too much, so let me limit the depth to two levels. Now, that makes more sense. I can easily see up to two levels of files and directories in a tree-like structure. And that's it. Now, let's move to the second CLI. The next CLI is also a replacement of a familiar command. If we want to output contents of a file, we execute cut. But the CLI I'm introducing here provides a similar functionality but with syntax highlighting, git integration and quite a few other things. Here's the output of the same YAML file. We can see that it is now colored, there are blind numbers and uh, as is the case of uh, lines 13 and 14 we can see which ones changed when compared to what is in git. From here on we can customize it by for example removing pagination and applying a theme and a style. Just as with EZA, we can create an alias in zshrc or bashrc or whatever, whichever shell, why am I saying whatever, whichever shell you are using. From now on, we can continue exercising our muscle memory by typing cut, but getting a much nicer output. We got a nicely formatted Go code. Brilliant, right? Now, let's move to the third CLI, which, unlike the previous two, is not a replacement of an existing command, but something completely, completely, completely different. FZF is a general purpose command line fuzzy finder. To explain it in simpler terms, it allows us to list and search files, or actually anything else. Here it goes. The output is the list of all files in the current directory and all subdirectories. From here on, we can use arrows up and down to navigate through the list. We can also narrow down the output by typing a part of the file name. So if you type YAML, we'll see only files that contain that string. Once we find the file we're interested in, we can press enter to output it. We can also choose to select multiple files through the dash dash multi argument. From here on, we can use tab to select any number of files and output them all by pressing the enter key. Now, outputting one or more file names might not be that interesting, right? The power, however, the power 
of FZF Lysin combining it with other commands. For example, we can use it with but, the one we explored previously, to preview the contents of the selected file. Now we can navigate through the list of files and instantly preview any of them. Since that preview is done by but, it is nicely colored and formatted. Since it would be impractical to try to remember such a long command, we should probably create an alias in zshrc or bashrc or whichever shell you're using. I'm getting tired of repeating that same thing. You should put aliases always in one of those two. Now we can preview files through the alias fzfp. The next in line is zoxide, which is a better version of cd command. Actually, better would be an understatement. It is much, 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 much better than cd. To use it, we will add zoxide init command to zshrc or bashrc or again, whichever shell you're using. It will effectively replace cd with zoxide. Now, let's take a look at the files and more importantly, the directories we have right now, right here. Now, let's say that we would like to go to the flake directory, which is inside the gen directory, which is inside devbox or dot devbox. Typically, we would need to execute something like cd dot devbox slash gen slash flake. With zoxide, which is now replacing cd, we can do it by simply telling it to cd to flake. Based on our navigation history, it figured out that we want to go to dot devbox slash gen slash flake and executed the equivalent of cd dot devbox gen flake. We are now three, three directories deep without having to type a single slash. Now, let's say that we would like to go back to the CLI's demo directory, which is three levels below the current directory. Instead of typing cd dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash, we can simply tell Zoxide to go to bliss, press the space key and then tab to autocomplete. It figured out that list is the substring of CLI's demo and took us there. In cases there are multiple directories in the history that contain the same substring, it would give us the list of all those that match the substring and let us choose where to go. Zoxide alone saves a lot of time, ton of time. I stopped thinking where is what since all I have to do is type a few letters of the directory I want to go to and Zoxide takes me there no matter where the directory is, as long as I visited it at least once before. To demonstrate the next command, we will first create a kind cluster. Fuck! That's the word I would utter every time I make a mistake like that. I typed kid instead of kind and that wasn't correct. Here's the thing though. Instead of yelling fuck before typing the command again, we can just type fuck. Now the first great thing about this command is that I can say fuck without sounding rude. That's the name of the command, it's not me being vulgar. Second, fuck gives us what would normally come after yelling fuck. It gives us a list of suggestions which command we should have executed instead. More often than not, the first suggested command is the correct one, but if it's not, then we can see other suggestions by pressing arrow keys up and down. Once we find the command we should have executed, all we have to do is press the enter key. Commands we execute often output JSON, YAML, TOML or some other format. If those would be files, we would format them with but. But. That's funny. But, but. Anyways, unfortunately, but tends to have difficulties working with the output since it uses file extensions to figure out what to display. Moreover, we often need not only to format but also to filter outputs. While that output is correct, there is no syntax highlighting. On top of that, many commands do not provide a way to filter outputs, while those that do, like kubectl, often use some silly syntax that is hard to remember. That's where jq comes into play, at least when JSON is concerned. We can, for example, take the previous command and pipe that output to jq to format it. Now, that over there is much easier to read. We can also filter the output to, let's say, retrieve status phase field. Thank <laughs> you.
The next in line is YQ, so not JQ, YQ, which is just like JQ, but for YAML. Even the syntax is almost the same. So we can, for example, output namespaces to YAML and pipe it to JQ to format it. Similarly, we can also use it to filter the output so that, for example, only the state to space field is returned. One notable difference is that YQ is not limited only to YAML. We can, for example, use JSON as input and YAML as output. Similarly, we can take YAML as input and output formatted JSON. Effectively, YQ is like JQ, but for YAML, but it can also replace JQ since it can work with JSON as well. That means that we do not necessarily need JQ anymore. Nevertheless, I tend to use both JQ for JSON and YQ for YAML. I'm aware that there is no need for JQ, but I'm so used to it that I keep using it. Then there is Teller. It is a universal secrets manager. I use it with almost every project I work in. If I need credentials for Kubernetes or Azure or AWS or Google or OpenAI or GitHub tokens or anything else, I add .teller YAML file to the project and in that file I point to whichever secret store I use. Over there I specify that Azure OpenAI API version secrets stored in my Google secrets manager should be used uh, as Azure OpenAI API version, but environment variable. The same goes for Azure OpenAI Endpoint, uh, OpenAI Key, OpenAI Model, and YouTube API Key. Actually, Teller is so convenient that I do not use it only for secrets, but for any kind of environment variables, no matter whether they contain confidential values or not. Now, here comes the important part. That file can be safely stored in Git and live side by side with the rest of the project. I or anyone else working with me on that project can instantly get all those credentials as long as they have the access to the secret store. From there on, there are many different formats we can use to output those secrets. We can, for example, output them as environment variables, which in this case, I will pipe to Teller Reduct so that you don't see them. I like you, especially if you're subscribed, so do it right now. However, I do not yet trust you. So, you will not see the secrets. We can redirect the output to a configuration file, like the one I use for Fabric, for example. We can use it to scan the source code for secrets. Now, look at that. It's clear that dot .fabric contains secrets and that I should not push it to Git, so I should either remove it or add it to Git Ignore. Teller is simple, yet it has quite a few different features that are very, very handy when working with confidential information, either locally or in CI CD pipelines. Now, if you're interested in it, you might want to check out that video over there since it has more details about Teller than what you saw right now. The next in line is GitHub CLI or GH. Even if you're using GitLab or if you're very unfortunate to be stuck with Bitbucket, you still need to interact with GitHub, at least when working with open source projects. GitHub is part of everyone's life, whether we like it or not. GitHub CLI is mostly focused on features and capabilities missing in Git itself. For example, if you would like to fork a repository instead of opening GitHub in a web browser and start clicking buttons, we can simply execute gh repo fork command and enter the clone of that repo. If you would like to set the fork as the default remote repository, we can do that with gh repo set default. If you are nostalgic and would like to see the repository in a web browser, we can do that with gh repo view. GitHub CLI is full of features. We can use it to create and manage pull requests, issues, and many, many, many other things. It's a must have for anyone working with GitHub, which effectively means everyone. Just like with the previous one, there is a video about it, so watch it if you want to know more. Now, let's go back before we move into the next CLI. The last CLI I would like to show you is DevBox. It is a tool we can use to create isolated shells or isolated environments. It is a wrapper around Nix shell that makes it more user-friendly and easier to use. It is potentially the most important tool in my toolbox. We are in a DevBox environment right this moment, right now. We can see that by taking a look at Teller CLI we explored a few minutes ago. We can see that it is not a tool installed permanently on my machine, but a tool that was installed specifically for this demo project. As a matter of fact, I do not have Teller on my machine at all. 
I have it only in this isolated environment. And look, I can prove that. I can go out of the dev box shell and try to locate Teller again. Look at that. It's nowhere to be found. It does not exist on my machine permanently, but only in environments I create with dev box. Now let's start a new dev box shell and try to locate Teller again. Now it's back. You see? You see it, you don't see it, it's back, it's gone. Depends what you want. DevBox allows me, you, us, everybody to specify all the tools we need for each individual project we work on and create isolated environments for each of them. That way we can have different versions of the same tool in different projects without any conflicts. Also, anyone working with us, with me, with you, on that project will have those tools as well. All we have to do is specify the tools we need in DevBox JSON file. If you would like to explore DevBox in more depth, you can guess what's coming, right? There is a video for that as well. Now, those are the 10 must-have CLIs I use on a daily basis. Which CLIs are your favorites? Please let me know in the comments. I would love, I'm dying to know what you're using and what I might be missing. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Cheers.